speaker for a wonderful minister, Reverend Langford. Thank you very much, Captain. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Welcome to you all worshiping here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in beautiful Jamaica. And greetings true to those listening via the World Wide Web. My welcome is really warm this morning because we have a nice warm morning, a little overcast, but still warm, here in Kingston. I'm really so happy to be sharing my thoughts with you all. Before I launch into my talk this morning, would you please turn to the inside cover of your program? I'd like you to read with me those statements by Dr. Ernest Holmes, our founder, which sum up the essence of our teaching. I have a feeling that some of us don't go to the back to those statements quite often enough to remind us of what our teaching really is about fundamentally. The headline, as we see, is A New Way to Think, and we're going to read together the first half a dozen statements. Together, there is a powerful good in the universe, greater than you are, and you can use it. There is no question about the creativeness of thought. If any thought is created, it must follow that all thought is created. The law of mind is exact. The only question is, how are we going to use this creative power within us? Shall we use it constructively for a definite purpose, or shall we use it destructively merely because we do not understand it? Change the idea of the thing, and you will change the thing. To learn how to think is to learn how to live. And that's by Dr. Ernest Coles, founder of Religious Science. Thank you. When she taught classes here, the founder of our center, Dr. Elmer Lumsden, delighted in telling a story about two little boys who fell from a mango tree. No, hold on, that, that didn't come out quite that. Right. She didn't delight in the fall, but in the lesson that comes from the, from the anecdote. Here it is. One boy was hurt when he fell, while the other was fine. And the hurt boy asked the other, How come we both fell from the mango tree and I'm in pain while you're okay? The second boy said, Well, I prayed this morning. The first boy said, I prayed this morning too. To which his friend replied, Yes, but I'm all prayed up. The image that comes to mind when I hear that story is of two cars, one with a full tank of gas, the other with only one gallon. The car with a full tank will be able to take you on any emergency trip, even if it is to the other end of the island, while the other car couldn't. I see the boy who was all prayed up as the counterpart to the car with a full tank of gas. Both are ready for emergencies. That is how you want to keep your car and yourself. Another way of saying you're all prayed up is to say you're spiritually fit. And my topic this morning is spiritual fitness. It comes from a book of that name, by Carolyn Reynolds. I think it is a wonderful book, and if you come to agree with me by the time I end my talk, you might want to buy the last copy or two that Reverend Anne has in the book group. I'll be focusing on chapter four of the book, which is on relationships. But let me give you a quick overview of 
the other chapters. You see, even if I persuaded you that chapter 4 is a must read, you couldn't buy it alone. With, with books as with relationships, you take all or you take nothing. <laughs> Fine, fine, fine. Now, spiritual fitness, and the subtitle describes it as, I quote, a guide to finding purpose and sacredness in your everyday life, it has seven chapters. Reynolds calls those chapters workouts. Workout one, titled Motivation Recharge, introduces basic motivation skills to give you the knowledge and momentum to launch yourself from that pad of lethargy that you've been resting on far too long. In the chapter, the author speaks to overcoming the fear of the unknown. And we know that's a really powerful fear, the unknown. You see, we tend to get into ruts and not want to leave the rut. Even if that rock is full of hard rocks and maca, which is drooping up, <laughs> that phrase translates as thorns which are sticking up. That's for, for the benefit of non-Jamaican listeners. Maca which are drukas, thorns which are sticking up. Reynolds also recommends the practice of thinking big but starting small. You all know the same. A journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Workout two, Soul Detox, shows you how to detox your soul from all the negative influence that might have accumulated over the years. Reynolds here shows us how to break out of automatic thinking to leave up the instinctive, reflexive response that we often have to events in our world, and to take a fresh look at those events. She speaks of dissolving negative beliefs by remembering that beliefs are not inborn. Instead, they come through socialization and our choosing, choosing to accept what we are told. As babies and small children, she says, we have no opinion. We learn from others how to perceive the world. And often we learn to perceive it in an unwholesome way. Many of us come to think that the universe is fundamentally unfriendly. But Reynolds reminds us that as we grow into adulthood, we become able because we improve our intellectual thinking, our thinking capacity. We become able to pick, choose, and refuse what we believe, what we accept into our minds. She also deals with the detoxifying power of forgiveness. And regulars at this church know that that is a topic which we often address. Workout 3, chapter 3, is minding your language. It provides you with the opportunity to examine your language, to see how truly powerful words are, and see how you can learn to use them to your maximum benefit. In this chapter, Renner shows that negative language, such as gossip, self-criticism, and lies, make us all feel bad. She encourages us to substitute positive self talk affirmations, and the like. That was chapter 3. I'll skip chapter 4 for now, because I'm focusing on that data. And go on to chapter 5, which is also known as Workout 5. It's learning to meditate. That chapter describes different ways of meditating and shows you how to discover the way that is right for you. Meditation, writes Van Reynolds, I'm quoting, is the way that we connect with our divine source and essence. 
unquote. Now that quotation suggests that meditation is the only way we connect with God, which of course is it's not. But it is a very, very good way. And I'm convinced that if everyone started today to meditate for just 20 minutes a day, by next Sunday, one week from today, the world would be appreciably more peaceful, more orderly, and more spiritual, as the Reverend John Nodding. He's the one who teaches meditation. And that would inevitably lead to a joyful, well-fed human life. The two are connected. Peaceful, orderly, spiritual man and joyful, wealthy human race. Direct connection. I know that many of you meditate and can testify to its benefits. Those who don't, please accept. You can make an appointment with the office for information on learning the arts of meditation. Workout 6 Taking the leap and finding your purpose gives very practical advice on how to deal with all the changes that will take place in your life as you move from a path of spiritual onto a path of spiritual reawakening. In this chapter, Reynolds mentions the temporary discomfort we may feel as we move from spiritual weakness, even ill health, to spiritual fitness. Don't be surprised at that. If your life needs drastic changing for you to be healthy, happy, and whole, there will probably be some discomfort. Change can be unpleasant. For example, you all know that when we do vigorous exercise after a period of inactivity, we we'll feel some muscle pain. Getting spiritually fit Reynolds states may bring on the experience called the dark night of the soul. But it's the dark before the dawn. And Reynolds stresses that we must have faith about the process. You see, the universal force does mean us good. The universe is fundamentally beneficial to us. Work out seven. Holding your power and living with joy teaches how to maintain your spiritual awareness in everyday life and continue to live with peace and joy. Now to work out four. It's called the Relationship Equation. That chapter guides you through the potential pitfalls of relationships and shows you how you can overcome those negatives and create and enjoy healthy, loving connections with others. An important concept that Reynolds requires us to grasp in order to move forward is what she calls soul-level thinking. In contrast with earth-level thinking, which is based on the belief that we are merely isolated, ego-driven beings who must fend for ourselves, in a hostile world. Consider the movers and shakers of this world. The leaders of countries, for example. The leaders of industry. Society leaders. And heads of family. All movers and shakers. Just suppose that most of those leaders practice earth-level thinking. Suppose that they are ego-driven and believe that there is a resource shortage in the world instead of infinite abundance. Suppose that they believe that other countries, other organizations, other political parties, and other families even are out to get them. Suppose they believe that. Wouldn't those leaders and their followers act in a way which would result in war corruption, crime, violence, and poverty. So do you see the cause of the civil war now in Syria and those in other various parts of Africa? Do you see the cause of the gang killings in Jamaica? Do you see the cause of the shutdown of the government in the United States? 
and the fact that six million people go to bed, children, sorry, go to bed hungry in America, the richest country in the world. It's that sort of thinking. It's quite unnecessary. Do you see that if those le leaders practice so level thinking instead, which is the opposite, of course, of earth level thinking, that they would behave different, differently and that world conditions would improve? It's all cause and effect. That is the fundamental law of this universe. There is a cause which starts with your thinking, and there is an effect. Think negative, the result will be negative. Simple math. With soul level thinking, Renner says, I quote, you become aware that you and everyone around you are eternal, are eternal souls on a mutual journey of self-discovery, unquote. She says that the soul never makes mistakes. Why? Because your soul is the infinite and all-knowing part of you. It connects directly with universal intelligence. It never makes mistakes. You have to think of at soul level. Your soul can see the highest purpose and perfection in every situation and is always guiding you to do the same. It's always guiding you, but you have to be quiet on this one. Let's look specifically now at soul level thinking and relationships. Reynolds says that at the soul level, we are driven to get into relationships because of a basic human need to overcome an earthly sense of separation. As babies, we instinctively love everybody and we want to connect with everybody. Babies will reach out and grab everybody who comes close to them. And we are born happy. Babies and puppies and kittens, we are born happy. Just look, you can see for yourself. These two things are our natural state. Unfortunately, as we grow older, we see that those around us are fearful and unhappy, and we become so true. Babies automatically adopt behavior and feelings that they encounter around them. But at the soul level, says Reynolds, we still know the truth, even as adults. We know that God's goodness is our natural birthright, and we yearn to get back to our true state that we were in at babyhood. And we yearn to take those we love back to that state with us. So we seek relationships. Some of those will be intimate, romantic relationships. Here's the thing, according to Reynolds. Earth-level relationships and soul-level relationships are not the same thing. When we normally use the term soulmate, what we mean, and I know you'll agree with me, what we mean is someone that we can love intimately and with whom we stay forever, even or after death. Renner's, however, is an intriguing new spin on the term soulmate. Our soulmate, she says, is not necessarily a romantic partner. Let me quote her definition. A true soulmate connection is a very sacred union that will rock your soul to its foundations and bring you to the greatest level of love and transformation that you may ever encounter. When soulmate is defined like that, it makes sense, doesn't it? That's what we mean in our way about with soulmate. But then you can easily see that the person who transforms your life at the soul level may not be a lover. It may be, for example, a spiritual being. But it could be a lover. 
When it is, there's passion, there's intense desire, there's an extreme emotion. And your soulmate could cause you intense pain. With your soulmate, you may be given the chance to explore the deep wounds of a sense of abandonment and isolation that you may have been carrying through your lifetime. Or you may be invited to overcome low self-esteem and become authentically powerful, the sort of person that you may have avoided in yourself for longer than you know. That's what a soulmate, a true soulmate, in its true meaning, according to Reynolds, does. I quote her again. Whatever the reason, meeting your soulmate will be one of the most challenging experiences of your life. She says, you are actually a lot less likely to walk up happily into the sunset with your soulmate than you are with any other person. When you and your soulmate have taught each other what you both need to learn, you can well separate, says Reynolds. Often, your contract together will be that you must part, and that this parting will be the final gift, this will cause the final soul searching and the consequent self-revelation that you have to give to one another. Parting, maybe that time. What Reynolds also says, if you can both understand the true purpose of your soulmate connection and honor your union as a rich training ground in which you have volunteered to learn and help one another, you will be able to maintain the relationship to the length of your earthly lives together. Um, Reynolds ends the section on soul relationship with this thought. If you are searching for your, for, or believe that you have found your soulmate, be prepared to take an advanced course in spiritual fitness and soul expansion. When you encounter your soulmate, begin with real gratitude in your heart. Then use your soul level thinking to guide you to some of the deepest, most challenging and joyful experiences that you will ever have on course. Reynolds' interesting and unorthodox approach to the soulmate issue made me remember the initially joyous but eventually painful romantic relationship that I had which led me directly to this church. And of course, to a new way of thinking and a new understanding of the fundamental truths of life. Reynolds reminds me to be grateful for the experience. I am. But Lord, it was sure thing. <laughs> But considering it now, 16 years or so late, the joy that I've felt since discovering science of man far outweighs the two years or so of pain that I suffered. I know that others here also came to this temple of light after being in some sort of valley of the shadow. That shadow took different forms for different people. But we are now all in the land. Say amen, church. Amen. amen. <laughs> Reynolds tackles several other issues in this relationship chapter. In a section titled, How to Get the Best from Your Relationships, for example, she lays out three laws for successful relationships. One is the importance of loving yourself. She says it's impossible for you to connect with someone else's heart if you haven't yet connected with your own. The greatest gift you can bring to your romantic relationship is your honest and healthy relationship with yourself. Make sense? 
Reynolds' second law is that of respect. You must respect your partner and your partner's soul journey, she said. Don't force him or her to do everything your way. And the third relates to freedom. I quote, the urge to control can be quite insidious and can take the subtlest of forms, unquote. Don't try to control your partner. They must be free to be themselves, just as you must be free to be yourself. There's a section in that chapter 2 on being single. Mm -hmm. She covers it all the days. And she points out, I quote, being single offers its own opportunities for self-exploration and expansion, and is often an essential friend to any kind of successful relationship, unquote. You see, remember your primary relationship is always with yourself. Reynolds stresses that. And this is so whether you're in a romantic relationship or not. First, connect with yourself. And there are many other insights to be had from this book. You really should buy, try to buy the last couple of copies that Reverend Anne has in the book. But if you don't get it, all is not lost. Did I mention that Reverend Anne and I are currently facilitating a spiritual fitness course on the book? I did it. How will this of me? That means that I didn't reveal that the next class on Tuesday from 7 to 9.30 p.m. is focused on chapter 4. Please feel free to drop in to that class. And if you like, to the other five classes in the course. Oh, when I say feel free to drop in, I, I don't mean the class class free. I mean you're welcome to drop in. You're sure to learn something interesting and useful about spiritual fitness in general, and if you come on Tuesday, about relationships in particular. Namaste.